Welcome to Quilting's first reality show, live and unscripted, with Susan Smith. Wasn't that grand? <laughs> I get such a kick out of him. And for those of you who may not know, the, the voice reference is, um, Dave, it escapes my mind. I want to say Inspector General, but that's not right. Pirates, Pirates of Penzance. It is the general. That's the word that was tripping me up. So if you've seen that show, that's kind of where that came from. Okay, today's project. We are going to work on a quilt that is pieced like a checkerboard. So we are gonna use that piecing to our advantage and call that our marking. And we're gonna quilt a crosshatch or grid design on it. So this would be some simple unthreatening ruler work. So I'll talk you through lots of the decisions as I load it and show you my favorite ruler and what is my favorite about it. It's not necessarily that specific ruler, but some qualities that you'll really like. Um, I'm quilting on my long arm Lucy. Lucy is a Gamel Elevate with a 26 inch throat. So I have a nice big clearance of quilting area to work, which is gonna come in quite handy today. And also I'm going to load onto Lucy the ruler plate. We'll, I'll probably wait to load it until we've got the close-up camera on and you can see what it looks like. It's really essential when you're working with a ruler. So let's get started with the backing and loading process first, and then we'll talk more about the quilt as we get to it. I'm gonna step out and grab it. Okay. Here's my backing. It is pieced and the quilt maker's name is Laura. So I'm just gonna refer to her as Laura throughout. She has pieced it with large squares and I don't mind a piece backing at all. I think they add interest to a quilt. But in this particular case, because she has used regularly sized squares, I'm gonna make an effort to square the quilt from side to side and from top to bottom as best I can. Now I say top to bottom loosely because I am also, okay, forgive me a minute, Mr. Producer's just reminding me, I need to move Lucy to the other side. It will go more easily dealing with um, cables, as you might imagine, we have camera cables all over the place. So just to avoid walking over them. Okay, so back to the backing. You can see that I am Putting my quilt the, the lengthwise, the longer measurement is actually running from side to side. I do this often because it means that I have fewer passes of the quilt, right? When the shorter distance runs this way. So if my quilt is not directional, if it doesn't matter, all other things being equal, I will always load a quilt laterally. However, when I refer to top and bottom as we're quilting, I mean the top of my rails and the bottom of my rails. So don't get um, disarmed by that. But let's get loading. So I'm loading my first edge. The edge is nice and straight on the side closest to me. And I use a red snapper system. This method still works. Even if you're pinning, you would just pin instead of snapping on this snapper. But either way, you need a straight edge closest to you to load first. I, let me back up. If you too use the red snapper system, it comes with small chunks of this red clamp that you, they recommend you use kind of to baste it in place and then go back and place the big rods. I'm all about saving a little time when I can. So I tend to put part of it on and use my hand for the basting purpose. So that's what I'm doing here. I'm making sure that quilt is straight. I do not want it stretched out. I don't want it squinched in. So I'm just looking at my seams, at the smoothness of my fabric, and gauging that. I hold it in place with my left hand, clamp it there, and then go back and squeeze this all on. I find if I don't hold it firmly here, if I just go along squeezing, the fabric will run away from me. So that does not work well. And this gives me a chance to, this is, you know, 12 or 14 inches that I can be assured that I'm not stretching or distorting it in any way. Clamp it in place. And I have just enough fabric under it, about an inch overlapping my leader, just enough um, that this will clasp it firmly, about the same as you would use if you were pinning. 
you could probably get away with a wee bit less if you were pinning, but not much. So this same method works even if you don't have red snappers for your machine. And you will see the genius of it in just a second. So I'm pulling it back a little bit because I saw my fabric was, was pulling up toward me underneath it. So I'm just straightening that and adjusting it, laying it back down, holding it in place, pinch, 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 pinch. And that's the front. And I just have a clamp on either end holding my leader where I want it to be. That's all those were doing. And then I walk around to the other side and pull my backing smoothly over this back rail. And this is key to this time saving method. You want to make sure your quilt is not pulled to one side or the other. And you will see that if you start seeing these diagonal kind of pulls in the fabric, you know it's not straight. So it's important. Let the fabric kind of, kind of guide you. You don't want to be pulling it off grain. And you want pretty even tension across it too. And if it was a big quilt, I would just let it fall all down the front of the machine, but keeping it as straight as I possibly could. Then I come back to my quilting side and I simply roll it on. And you can see it's pulling on fairly straight with the grain of fabric. That's exactly what I want to see. And just that simply, I'm ready to attach the other end. And I pulled it just a little too far forward, so I'm going to pull it back about a half an inch. Now, Laura's quilt back is nice and straight, but if perchance this edge was not straight, I would not have to worry about it. I would just let the excess hang off below my grippers. And honestly, the same is true for the sides. If they weren't quite straight, for example, when you have a 108 inch wide backing, that's a, a really good problematic backing that is almost always distorted and crooked. I don't worry about trying to square it up. I just need one straight edge to start with. And as often as I can, I will make that the selvage edge, then I know it's straight. Oh, I can hardly reach with Lucy in the way here. There we go. Okay, I'm sure you got a nice view of the back of my head. Sorry about that. Trotting back around Lucy, getting my steps in. And just like that, we have a loaded backing. And you can see how nice and straight this is. It is flat. One side's not tighter or looser. It works so well. And I've gotten a lot of questions in this last week about the tightness of my quilt. I've been posting little reels of quilting and people keep asking, how does it not bounce? When I leave my quilt loose, it bounces so badly. So my rule of thumb, even after the top of the quilt is loaded, is I should be able to stick my fingers, the tips of my fingers up against the quilt and pinch them. Like this, this is not tight like a drum. It's tight enough to be smooth, but it's not drum tight. So that's that. Mr. Producer says there's a question about the backing. Let's have it. Jill, how do you keep your leader in place while you snap? I, you probably can't see it on the camera. I have a small clamp. Oh, well, you can't because of Lucy. I have one of the original clamps that came with my machine and I keep them really short on each side, just long enough to grab the corners of the leader and hold it in place for me. That's how I do it. So my batting today, as so often, is Hobbs 8020, my favorite all-purpose batting. It's kind of a mid-loft, economical price. The 80% is cotton, the 20% is poly. And I will mention one other thing. I said earlier that I was going to attempt, as best I could, to center the quilt, just because these backing squares are very symmetrical, same size in each direction. So I laid the quilt backing and the quilt out on my floor beforehand to see how much excess I had this way. So let me show you how, how that plays out. And this is not precise. If you need to be closer than a half an inch, you might have to do some more finagling, but this works for most quilts. So obviously I can see on this end 
and on this end. So that's easy to center. It's this one that's tricky. So laying it out on the floor beforehand, I determined that I had five inches of excess fabric on each side of the quilt, but top and bottom of my quilting, if that makes sense. And because I knew this would be buried under the snapper and I wouldn't be able to see it, I actually put a pin in at the five inch mark before I loaded. So that's going to be my guideline for the top edge of my quilt. I'm going to pull the batting up just a little bit. I don't want to cut corners so tightly that I end up running short there. Okay. And if we want to be precise, we could actually count squares and we could get right in the middle. Yep, right on the center seam. Look at that. Looking for my pin, moving down just a little. So that will give Laura a pretty well centered quilt on her lovely pieced backing and basically make a reversible quilt out of it. Okay, that's my top. Now before I start quilting, let's talk thread for a jiffy. Because as you can see, this is a kind of off-white um, in every other checkerboard and then mixed greens for the checkers in between. And so what thread to use is, is a conundrum. And what I eventually chose is this one. It's, it, it is green. I know on camera it will probably look gray. It certainly has gray tones. But in my experience, this particular thread is really good at blending well with a lot of colors. I can use it with grays, with reds, with blues, with greens. Like it almost picks up a bit of the color that it's on. So it's a really good blender. So I thought a good choice that's not too high contrast on the eggshell and not as contrasted as cream would be if I used an eggshell thread, for example, on these dark greens. So kind of middle of the road, airing a bit toward lighter. And then because the backing, which you saw when I held it up, has more dark greens and very little light fabric, I opted to go a couple of shades darker, as you can see on the bottom thread. And those of you who watch regularly know, I generally choose to do the same thread top and bottom because even, even if you have perfect tension, that thread shows through a little bit in the needle holes or it can. So for example, I never do a white and a black or a white and a navy. But a shade or two apart, absolutely, you can get away with that. So that's my choice this time, is to, to make my backing, my bottom thread, a little bit darker against that backing and to keep this one lighter, okay? So that's my thread choices. So as I mentioned earlier, feel free to be sharing this with your friends. And if you're finding this kind of information and sort of informal instruction helpful, please do like and subscribe and hit the little bell and then you'll get notifications whenever I go live. And I do these live and unscripted shows regularly, streaming more than shows. They are the first and the third Friday of every month. So on those dates, if you can join live, as you saw this morning, it's interactive at the beginning, but throughout the course of the show, you can type in your questions and I'll pause kind of after each pass and answer those questions while I'm working. So let's get basting. One more thing before I baste, because I need a sip of coffee before I get started. And you guys know that I love my coffee. Um, this show very much is made possible by your support. And if you're interested in supporting, you can simply go to buymeacoffee.com forward slash stitched by Susan. And there you can either choose you know, a single coffee contribution or a monthly subscription, totally up to you. But we use all those funds to you know, improve our cameras and the last thing we got was a nice new rolling table for Dave to move all his equipment for Mr. Producer. So that was really nice. And one last thing, if there's, if that doesn't suit you for contributing, there is another thing that we could use. All of our cameras at this point are iPhones. So if any of you have an iPhone that you no longer want to use and would consider donating it, let us know. It needs to be a seven or newer, but I mean, that gives you some years of leeway. So if you've upgraded and you don't know what to do with your old phone, reach out to us. We'd really appreciate that and it would give us additional camera angles and a few more options. So yeah, iPhone 7. And coffee, the elixir of life. Alrighty, let's get basting. So I'm going to first baste up the left side. Do I not have a bobbin in? I do, but the thread is not 
through correctly. Paste to check. I'm just going to check my tension here. Feels good. All right, let's try that again. So I am very simply just basting the left, the top, and the right side of my working area. Um, you certainly could do it with a larger basting stitch. I don't bother changing my stitch size, so I'm just using my regular quilting size. And I'm making sure my stitching falls well within the quarter inch seam allowance so that when the binding is sewn on, it will cover this up and this basting never has to be removed. This is really critical for keeping a quilt square and straight and keeping things from shifting while you quilt. My machine has a feature called a channel lock, which is a magnetic lock on the rails. And that is what I use, especially for this long straight edge. So right now I've got that lock turned on. So my machine is stitching a straight line. That saves me having to pin it or sort of line up this straight edge because I'm just adjusting it a little as I stitch because I know my stitching is straight. So I end up with this beautiful, absolutely straight horizontal line on the top. And I'm just manipulating the fabric a little bit with my left hand to make sure that it stays smooth doesn't get pushed ahead at all with the hopper foot. And now I'll change my channel lock to vertical. And I will get a beautiful vertical line. And if it doesn't feel comfortable to you to sort of wing it like I do, by all means, take the time to pin it and get everything placed before you start stitching. I've done that many times too, but I know you've heard me say it before, but I recently passed the thousand quilt mark and so I'm pretty comfortable winging the basting now actually which end shall I put Lucy at we'll do it this way I wanted to show you guys what the ruler plate looks like and this is a great opportunity different machine brands it will look a bit different but in general it's a small there you go it's a small plate that fits over the arm and provides a resting surface for the ruler make sure my threads aren't caught under it there we go so that now I've got this stable surface and it's critical. You really can't do ruler work with just the arm of the machine. The arm has curve on the top and your ruler rocks and oh, it would just frustrate you to no end. Okay, let's take a question or two before we actually dive in, yes? Shall I move Lucy some more? Lucy is very large. Okay. Questions? Betsy, I missed it. What is the color of the top thread? Thanks for these informative sessions. Well, the brand I'm using is Isacord. Um, so the color number is 0151. But it's a khaki, if it's gray, it's got green tones. And if it's green, it's got gray tones. But it's just really good at picking up and kind of blending well with other colors, fabric colors. Susan Clark, I'm sorry I missed that, Dave. Yes? Okay, got it. Laurel, did I miss if you put magnets on your front side before basting? Um, thanks for reminding me. I usually do them after basting, and I was thinking while I was moving Lucy, got to put those magnets on, so here they come. And these are always a point of conversation. I just love them. These magnets are simple bars, usually available at the hardware store. They're the type that you would hang knives on in your kitchen or perhaps tools on in your shop. Inexpensive. And I just put them along the front rail of my quilt because my bar is um, steel. And that holds this fourth side stable. So now I've basted, 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 magneted, and none of this can shift now. I can quilt my heart out in this part and it won't pull up. It's all held nice and stable. So that's what the magnets do. And I'm going to put a disclaimer in here. One of my students emailed me a picture this week. She got two of her magnets stuck together and she actually pinched a chunk out of her finger. They were, so just be careful. Find what works for you. It is a tool. They have a, they have a hollow end. And so that's how I use them with my finger. I have seen people attach knobs. They have a, a drilled hole, a pre-drilled hole. I've seen people attach knobs to them. So if that works better for you, do it. I found it faster to just use my fingertips, but 
be careful and get comfortable with them. Okay, more questions? Northern Sioux. Do you have a preference for how seams on the backing and front are pressed, open to the side, and why? On the backing, I absolutely prefer the seams to be open because it makes a flatter backing and less of a ridge that you will feel in the finished quilt. I always prefer them open in the backing. On the front, I don't really care. If I'm doing edge to edge, for sure, I'm just going to stitch over them no matter which way they are. So it doesn't honestly matter to me if I'm doing custom quilting and stitching in the ditch then I prefer them to the side. So there's lots, there's lots of ifs ands in this situation. Let's put our little side clamps on. All these things, I get talking and then I sort of forget my routine. Side clamps. These also are the red snapper system. It doesn't really matter to me what brand you use. Well, it doesn't matter to me. <laughs> it shouldn't matter to you either, except what's lovely about these is they're long. So then I get this even tension on the side of my fabric. So any brand that will give you a nice long grip is ideal as opposed to this type of clamp, right? Which comes often with a machine and it just pulls at that one little area. That's the beauty of these clamps. And again, I'm, I'm stretching out the strap on the left. You can't really see it. And I'm just putting enough tension that this is snug. It does not need to be pulled, just snug. That's all we need. I'm doing the same thing on the right. On my particular model, my straps are not elastic. They're Velcro and I quite like that. I can decide how tight they are. There's no elastic deciding what the tension shall be. That's my personal preference. All right, we are finally ready to start quilting. I'm gonna start in a corner. And I'm going to do just one more thing. Can you guys see this? My ruler plate is bumping up against uh, my gripper here. So I keep a pair of trusty yardsticks that I can slide right under my strap, just lifting this enough that it won't catch that ruler plate. Otherwise, when I quilt over toward this ruler plate and it bumps, I'm apt to get a joggle in my quilting. We don't want that. So I will do that on both ends and we're good to go. Oh, we've got to talk about the ruler. Here's the ruler that I love. Um, this is the first straight ruler I ever bought and might be the only straight quilting ruler actually that I own. It is by A1 Quilting Machines. What I love about it is the handle. So, and I also like the nine inch size. I feel like that's big enough to do big things and small enough to do small things. And I don't like having a thousand rulers, but what I love best is the gripper because there's any number of ways that I can hang on to this as opposed to always just doing this motion to hold it still, right? This is very fatiguing if you're doing a lot of quilting, but having the option of, you know, moving fingers and thumbs, that's what I love. So there are other brands that have other ways of gripping they work too, but the gripper is what's critical to me. All right, let's get stitching. I'll stitch a little bit and then talk some more. It feels like I've been talking nonstop for a very long time. You will see my thread path. I've looked at how far downwards I can quilt without running into my front rail. And I think I can do one more. I'm gonna go slowly in case I hit that rail. There we go. So what I'm going to do now is basically zigzag across my entire quilt, back and forth and back and forth till this whole first five row bit is quilted. That means I don't have to roll my quilt back and forth. I do not have to quilt in one entirely continuous line across the grid. So when I advance my quilt then, I'll just do another pass and just those points will just meet and continue on, if that makes sense. So I am literally just using the points of these seam intersections for my lineup. Now, if you've used rulers at all, you know, you're stitching the hopper foot away from your ruler. So I do have to eyeball lining up my ruler a quarter inch from that intersection so that my stitching falls at that intersection. Does that make sense? And now we're going to go back to the other side.
and I am going to follow through and do a secondary grid um, so that it's half this size when it's all finished. But we'll just keep going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth until we've done all of that. So this type of quilting is a great way to get comfortable with quilting with a ruler. I still remember so clearly my first quilt that had a ton of ruler work. And I just felt like I had such a hard time controlling the ruler, you know, keeping it straight, how hard to push. If you push too hard, it, you know, you're, um, there's resistance against that plate underneath. If you push too soft, it moves. And I don't know a shortcut for that other than do it. Do it a whole bunch. And at the end of a quilt, you'll feel much better. It's like learning to use a new tool. It just gets comfortable. So this is a really non-threatening way to do it because I can adjust. If I see I'm not lining up right here, if I see I'm not lining up with that tip, I'll just tip my ruler a little bit and line it up a bit differently. And that does not show at all in the end. So this is a great type of quilt to practice on. And I would say Laura's squares were cut three inches and they're two and a half now. But honestly, any checkerboard will work. If it's this size or bigger, you might wanna do, you know, the double cross hatching. If they're smaller, you could get away with just this single cross hatching. That's entirely up to you how much quilting you want. You can probably see, I am shifting my ruler a little bit from time to time. And it all looks good in the end. There's a shift, did you see that? You can see the beauty of these different ways to grip my ruler. I find it very awkward personally to try and switch sides to hold my ruler in my right hand and drive my machine with my left hand. So I love a ruler that has multiple grips so that I can always keep it in my left hand. Again, that may just be me, and obviously if you're left-handed, that might be the opposite for you. But I see a lot of variation in quilters and how they hold their rulers and how they manage moving them. So you just experiment with what works for you. But I guarantee you, once you've done a whole quilt of this size, you'll be much more comfortable with it. Also, it's a really good way to use up your scraps. Really, really good. Laura makes quite a lot of these checkerboard quilts. And if you look back through earlier um, Live and Unscripted episodes, I think I've done one as a crosshatch before, and I believe I did one with S curves which is just a different style of um, quilting in these squares, does not require a ruler, gives a different look, but still uses the piecing as the marking guide. No marking necessary. And it's kind of fun to think up different ways to quilt these checkerboards. All right, so you can see I have got the single one is completely finished. So I'm just gonna travel in my basted line and start quilting the squares that are between. So the same depth of quilting pass, if you will. Just doing all the alternate points now. And now we're going to end up with a grid that is about an inch and a half when it's all said and done. Oops. Overshot that one just a hair. while I quilt, because this can be a wee bit like watching paint dry, I will tell you about a couple more things going on in my world. Um, number one, I do have a podcast. 
related to quilting and or crafting, and it's called Measure Twice, Cut Once, and other life lessons learned from quilters. So this past week, a new episode comes out every Wednesday. So this past one was with Vanessa Christensen of the Co. Um, she's the lady, she's the genius behind Moda's ombre lines. So that was fun. Um, and you can find that at podcast.stitchedbysusan.com. And right from there, you can choose your favorite um, app to download it on. So I would love if you would have a listen to that and leave me a rating and or a review. That would be grand. And also, I am going to be launching this coming week, so the second week of February, um, a pop-up Facebook group. So it's just going to be a short-term group geared toward the type of um, freehand and edge-to-edge quilting that I absolutely love to do. So I've got some topics slotted for each day for a 10-day period of time. And these are based on questions that I received last time I did a pop-up group from quilters just like you. And there will also be a live Q&A session near the end where you can bring in fresh questions. So be watching for that um, on my Facebook page, Stitched by Susan. And also if you are a newsletter subscriber, you will get a direct link to sign up for that group. So it's just going to be a short period of time, a short little um, community, quilting bee if you will, for sharing lots of information, photos if you like, asking questions if you like, about freehand quilting. I don't have a long-term group for this topic just because it does take time and I want to be present in it. So I find it helpful to do these short little pop-ups, kind of um, focus on it for a week or two, and then go back to regularly scheduled programming, so to speak. It is a free group. I don't know if I said that, but yeah, it is absolutely free to join. It is just a community for chatting about the quilting that we love. And these live and unscripted episodes are always the first and third Friday of each month and at 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. The topics differ. Usually they are chosen by, they're dictated by what type of quilts I currently have from my clients. And um, when I have something that I think would be of interest to a lot of people, then I reach out to that client and ask if it's okay if their quilt is the model. And then away we go. Um, that's not quite all of it, so I've got to do some traveling here. That's what this basted line can be really helpful for, just moving to a new area. Start a new line of stitching. Isn't that looking sharp? This is a great idea for the guys in your life. It's kind of a, a tailored look, this cross hatching. And I always love a texture that turns gorgeous when you wash it and it crinkles a bit. And this definitely fits the bill there too. Okay, we're almost finished this pass, so bring on your questions. I'll basically do a repeat of the loading process. We'll roll forward and attach all the grippers and so forth again. Um, I'm just casting an eye over it. That's everything. That pass is done. So I can actually leave needle down in the fabric and it can just remain there while I advance. Let me get everything off, please, Mr. Producer, before you start pulling questions up. While I do this, I'll give some credits. My husband is the person behind the cameras and the monitors and all the buttons that he's pushing. This is not a one-woman show, that's for sure. So thanks to Dave for that. And our good friend, Dan Unger, who graciously allows us to use his lovely guitar music. We appreciate it so much. Mm -hmm. 
I could do a little longer expanse than I have done, but when I get too close to that, um, the roll, then you guys can't see as well. So I've opted to keep them short. And in fact, this is not a large quilt, right? Here's the end. So there's only two more passes in any event. Let me get my basting line in here, actually both sides basted, and then I will grab a drop of coffee and chat with you guys for a minute and get all my grippers put back on. So I'm winging it at this moment. I don't even have my channel lock on. So you guys, it is a reality show. That is really and truly how I do it at home. But you do what's comfortable for you. Pin if you need to. Put a channel lock on if you need to. Even use a ruler if you need to, to do that basting line. I'm just gonna give a little tug to the batting. I feel like it's a bit rumpled under there. Feel it, yep, a little bit. Right there, much better. I could just feel a kind of fullness in there. I'm always trying to kind of gauge things. And in particular, I'm watching that my seam lines here are straight on my front roller. And if I find that they're not, this is where I make my adjustments. What I don't want to do is proceed through several passes and have it getting further and further off of straight. Pretty easy to make small adjustments as you go. Difficult to deal with an inch of offness when you're almost at the end. So the quilt has all these lovely avocado greens. Did you notice that I wore my goldenrod? We're all 70s today, all retro. Okay, let's have questions. Let me get my coffee, okay? Here we go. I'll stand back from the quilt. All right, what are our questions? Lynn, and what foot are you using for ruler work with your gamel? I don't even, do I know the name of this? It's the round foot that's a quarter inch on every side, side to side and front to back, quarter inch. Pretty much the ruler I use for 98% of my quilting. I don't even change it out. Maury, this is so freeing. If you've ever tried to do edge to edge cross hatching with a computer, it's really fiddly to get the rows matching. I'm totally going to try this. I have not. I love doing it this way. So I have not even branched out into doing it with the computer. I can see places for that, but on a quilt that's got such lovely square intersections, why wouldn't you use them? Lynn, although your blocks are nice and square, do you not worry about distance between lines and concentrate on reaching the corner of the blocks instead? That is correct. And even if the blocks were not perfectly square, I think that's still what I would do is aim for the corner. If the seams didn't perfectly intersect, then I just wouldn't worry too, too much about it. Jane, do you consider these lines crosshatch as a custom design for charging customers? I don't, I still call it edge to edge. Um, it is, I have a couple of levels of edge to edge because I have some quilters that want two and three inch spacing and some that want it, you know, more dense. So it's a little higher than some of my others, but not by much. I still consider this edge to edge. And that's it. Oh, Susan, I always learn so much from you. I appreciate seeing you load and offering loading and advancing tips and tricks. Great. That's the first sip I even got in. I was too busy talking. Okay, let's get the goodies all back on. So our side grippers. First off, and I do, by the way, consider side grips of some, of some type essential. So if you don't have these broad ones and you just have the single narrower ones, still use them. Just be sure not to pull them too tight, but it is so important to avoid any wrinkles in the backing of your quilt. I mean, better safe than sorry. There, I just can't imagine anything worse than unloading a quilt and finding there's a, a wrinkle in there that got quilted in. Uh, how awful. And it only takes a minute to put these on and it really helps to alleviate that possibility. Magnets and a yardstick while I'm at this end. I think I've thought of everything this time. I know you guys will remind me if I forgot anything, won't you? Third magnet, second yardstick. 
we're in business. Now, when I do freer edge to edge designs, I usually alternate passes, you know, left to right, right to left. I don't feel like it matters on this quilt. Obviously, it doesn't matter. We're cross hatching. So I don't need to worry about that this time. So I'm just starting at a point where I left off and you'll see, we're just going to quilt a bunch more. One, two, three, four, five. Yep, we're going to do five again. And they'll just touch up against the previous row. Super simple. I'd be really curious how this holds up for time against a computerized crosshatch. I don't know that the quilting is a lot faster, but I feel like the time savings in setting it up and trying to line it up are possibly quite significant. One of these days I'll find a quilter who does digitized designs and we'll go head to head. Wouldn't that be fun? Just a little competitive streak in me. Right here, you can see I'm just touching up against my existing stitching. I just make it as accurate as I can. And no one will ever know when looking at this quilt where that splice happened. It looks seamless. Is that the right depth? My first one, I didn't go down far enough. Look at that, you guys. You weren't counting. So all that's going to happen is at some point I'm going to have to do a little bit of joggling to finish it. Might have to do a bit of backtracking, but it is not the end of the world. But if I wanted to be sure and avoid that, an easy thing to do would have been to put a piece of painter's tape across my, uh, you know, as a sort of barrier to know how many rows to go down. could have avoided that. See, here it is right here. To begin with, I'm just going to joggle around and we'll, we'll see how it comes out. I'll look before I go on to the next pass and make sure everything got covered. Even if I had to, you know, break thread and, and start a new seam, that would not be the end of the world, would it? It would be A-OK. -okay. My machine has a very nice um, coast, I guess you would say, where when I'm holding still and moving my ruler, the needle is still engaged, but doesn't crazily stitch on me. If your machine doesn't do that, then you might want to pause like this every time you, re you know, when you're shifting your ruler. That's just something that depends very much on your machine. You can see that my needle keeps slowly bobbing up and down. And that works well for me. But if you don't have that feature, don't let it stop you from doing ruler work. And as always, I will take some lovely photos of this quilt and post them on my social media so that you can see, you can get a good um, big picture view of how this looks in the finished quilt. Today we have a super overcast day, so it might be a day or two until I get some good daylight for the photos, but I promise I will post them. And I am stitched by Susan on all the places, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. little jog took care of things. I just had to put that one 90 degree little box down there, half a box, and now we're up and running again. Cool.
I love all these green fabrics that Laura included. There's a wide variety. There's plaids and dots and speckles and leaves and a wide variety of greens. I would say they're all a little bit khaki toned, so it makes it, um, you know, there's kind of a theme going on. There's no emerald green or kelly green, for example. But within that, there's a broad range of light, mid, and dark. It really makes this little quilt sparkle. And over the years that I have quilted for Laura, she's done these checkerboards in lots of different colors. I don't know this, but I suspect she cuts her scraps into three inch squares. And then over time, you know, when she gets a whole bunch of greens, here comes a green quilt. Or I think she's done some green and pink ones too, a two color checkerboard. Also really effective. So that's a little side tip. That can be a way to manage your scraps. Cut them into a size that you think that you'll use for a particular design. I've made a, a, one particular scrappy quilt many times that uses brick shapes. So I cut my scraps two and a half by four and a half because that's what works in the scrappy quilt that I love. If you have any questions about the ruler, let me know. I think honestly the most critical thing is just starting to use it. And that feel for how much pressure to apply is just something you learn. It's a bit like, you know, how to grip your pencil or pen when you're writing. As a first grader, you know, it was probably white knuckled. Um, but as you do it, you, you relax a little bit and you learn how much pressure is needed to keep it still while not so much that it, you know, the fabric is almost pushing because it's being squeezed so hard between ruler and ruler plate at the bottom. So again, this is just the greatest quilt for practicing that on. Not too demanding, not too many angles. It's fabulous. Someone noticed early on that I quilt in bare feet. You know, there's something about it. I swear I feel the quilting in my feet. I don't know. I do many things bare feet. I just like it. Feels like, yes, I have one more pass and again I have to travel. This is different for every quilt because depending on how many checkers there are is kind of how well that pass works out. But usually you have to travel at some point. And that's okay. That's what the basting um, seam allowance is for. So I'm pretty much lining up my ruler for every square. Like 
How do I describe that? I look ahead. When I'm at this point, I'm looking ahead across the next ivory square, and I'm trying to make that adjustment with each square. I mean, I line it up for two most of the time, but that does not always work. The fabric might have shifted a little, whatever. So I kind of um, adjust with each new point. Great time to be typing in your questions. We have one, two, three, four, five, exactly five more. This time there will be no mistaking how far to quilt with my pass, because it'll be the end. Pause, Susan. My grippers are still on the side. They're underneath, underneath the batting, because my batting is extra wide this time. No, just the one, just the one. You'll have to forgive me. I often do that when we're on these live shows because I'm busy talking and sometimes I forget the other things I should be busy doing. I'm gonna go ahead and clip. You guys can't really see me. But I mentioned that I um, use my grippers on the sides to hold my leader in place. And I'm actually doing that with my last pass. So when I'm done this current quilt that I have on, that front rail is already set up for the next quilt. To many of you, that doesn't matter, but that's how my head runs. I'm like, okay, I have to get a couple of quilts done today. Let's be super efficient. That's one of the ways it saves my leader falling down and having to be picked up and attached back on again. So probably saves me all of, oh, three seconds. And I do put, I, I was winging my vertical line, but I do put my channel lock on for this bottom line as well because I want to get a nice straight line. So I'm gonna take it slow, adjust it with my fingers as I go. I'm watching that these seam lines are staying straight, that it's not pushing off to one side. If you're not comfortable, again, just winging it, by all means, drop a few pins in there so you know where you're at. And I'm pulling down on it, making sure that I don't have any excess building up back here either. Again, you can pin if you're not comfortable winging it the way I do. But I did tell you, you're in my studio, right? <laughs> Therefore, we're doing it my way in here. And again, I've got my eye on what's behind my hopper foot, making sure I'm not getting any excess building up there. If I did, I pull just a little in front, like what's already been stitched. You can probably see that. When I pull on it, it pulls the fabric just a little faster under the needle. That little bit can be enough to save you having a pleat in this line of basting. Just like that, we're at the end. Since it doesn't matter which side I start on, I'm gonna leave my needle at the closest point there. Put all my side apparatuses back on. Apparatuses? Apparati? What's the plural there? I know someone will know the answer to that. Mr. Producer, would you mind handing me a tissue? Having a little sip of coffee? Okay, have we got some questions before we dive into the last pass? Okay, okay, but I'm reading. You're the camera, there's the reading. <laughs> there you go, he can put me on the camera that's pretty straight, which works super well. Sometimes I have to take my eyes off, or my, <laughs> take my eyes off. Sometimes I have to take my eyes off to read the, the comments. Julianne, hi, joining during my lunchtime. How nice, thanks for joining us. Laurel, I'm still in a pinning system till I have and I have some, some scrap pursues the depth of my quilting space. I pin to the edge and then put my clamps on the scrap and seams to catch it evenly. I'm paraphrasing there. But absolutely, if pinning makes you more comfortable, it takes way less time to pin than it does to undo. So absolutely. Teresa, 
Any thoughts how to solve this? What was the problem I was talking about? Teresa, we can't remember the problem. So if you want to remind me of what that was that I was talking about, I'll come back to that. Northern Sue, I like this look. Wondering if there are other styles, patterns of quilt tops where you'd consider this quilting. If there are not the reference, oh, the points of the blocks. Um, generally, no. And I've had, I've had folks come and ask me to quilt like a pre-printed panel, for example. Just print that with crosshatch. And I say to them, okay, but marking it will take longer than quilting it. So do you want to pay for, you know, a two times pass? Because I don't have a digital design to do the crosshatch. So my solutions are either take that to a digital person or pick a different design. Because crosshatching when you don't have the seams requires marking every single line. Victoria, don't know if anyone asked this, but where can I get the side clamps like you have? Love them. Dave says he put a link in the comments. They are part of the Red Snapper system. And there's a shop called Quilts on the Corner. I believe they're in Nevada. That's who designed the Red Snapper system and that's where you can purchase them. And if you don't mind, tell them I sent you because I'm trying to get a little affiliate deal going on there. And if she knew I was sending people, that might work better. Christine, what stitch length do you prefer to use for your overall quilting? I usually do 12 or 13. I've got 12 on right now. And Wanda, what speed do you use? Today, Wanda, I have the regulated mode on, so it is set for 12 stitches per inch, and when I move faster, the motor goes faster. Does that make sense? There are times when I quilt with the constant mode where the needle is just going at a fixed pace, but I don't usually for ruler work. Teresa, regarding your recent short, when I quilt my line, my... We're not sure what you're asking, Teresa, but keep trying and we'll keep coming back to it. Meantime, I'll quilt for a few minutes, unless there's more, Dave. Is that it? That's it. Okay. Let's quilt a few lines. We'll have time at the end for more questions once more before I go, too. And once again, if you find this helpful, please, please like and subscribe and share with your friends. I love doing this. I love explaining things. It is my pleasure to help other quilters avoid the stand and stare syndrome. So I would love to reach more quilters. stick on this end. I'm just going to add that in case. Again, it is faster to an ounce of prevention, as my mother used to say, is worth a pound of cure or undoing in the case of quilting. I would love if you would chime in too, honestly, on whether you found the kind of corny introduction to be kind of corny or just dumb. Sometimes it's hard to know, you know, whether it's just internal family humor and you should keep it to yourself or whether it's actually enjoyable because we have a whole lot of different voices recorded. And if you guys want to hear them, we'll, we'll trot them out different voices week by week. We have Yoda, we have a Frenchman, we have... Oh, we have all kinds of things. And they strike us really funny, but I don't know if they strike you equally funny. James Bond, oh yeah.
we'll have to add Will to the credits too, the, the son who um, did these voices. His name is, in fact, Will Smith. And we weren't being copycats, truly. That was before the Will Smith you all know and love was famous. Also, it was Will's grandfather's name, so it was a no-brainer. I imagine that a number of you watching, like me, have grandkids in other parts of the country or world. I tell you what, I am so grateful for technology these days. I mean, to be able to visit with my wee grandkids on an almost daily basis via video. You know, they're currently toddler and tiny infant. But they know me, know my voice, know me by name. We share, you know, baking and dishwashing and all the things. It is so wonderful, isn't it? And we're traveling. Now here I could decide to go left or right and it doesn't matter. There's no right or wrong there. I just think it's kind of neat how this cross hatching works that you can just zigzag back and forth and back and forth and eventually the whole thing gets covered. Very, very little stopping and starting. I don't think I've stopped at all, have I, in this whole quilting process. I do have another bobbin loaded just in case, but I might make it to the end on this one going to be a near thing. I'm also curious what you think of my thread choice, which is obviously darker than the eggshell, probably the color of some of the lightest greens. That's a bit a matter of personal preference, but I thought I preferred it to not be too stark on the eggshell colors. But I felt like eggshell might be a little too high contrast in the dark greens. So this, I think, works beautifully, kind of a grayish green. But I'm curious to know what you think. those of you who are watching this in the replay, we've kind of changed up our format a little bit. Um, when we initially begin our live session, the first couple of minutes are very informal and chatty and getting acquainted, and those do not remain forever on um, the YouTube video. So if you want to be a part of that, you got to tune in to the live broadcast. This gives us an opportunity to get to know each other and it gives Mr. Producer just a couple minutes to make sure 
that everything is working to plan. Just a couple more lines, so last call for any questions or comments that you have. And last reminder, if you are finding this helpful, please like, subscribe, hit the little bell so you get notifications, and most importantly, share, share, share with your friends. I so appreciate it. And if you're bored today, have a listen to my podcast, Measure Twice, Cut Once, and you can find that at podcast.stitchedbysusan.com. And to be on the lookout, too, for the little pop-up Facebook group that is coming that is dedicated for the topic of freehand and mostly edge-to-edge -edge quilting. So there's going to be some topics of discussion every day. And it's a great place to ask questions, to answer questions, if you have advice to offer. And I hope to see you there. That will be coming out next week, the second week of February. I believe is the end. Once again, I'll just cast an eye over it. Yeah, it looks good. I am pleased. And the bobbin made it. Let's just go have a peek at how much is left. There can't be very much. Okay, I can't see the camera, hun. There's a little bit left. There's a little bit left. We weren't running out quite yet. There you go. Nice to know. Okay. Any final questions? And where do I want to put Lucy? I'm going to put Lucy on the hard right. There we go. Okay. What have we got for comments? Why don't I get my coffee while we do this? Hang on a sec. Here we go. Catherine, thank you so much, Susan and Mr. Producer. This is very helpful. Good. Christine, what's the brand of ruler you are using? It's by A1 Quilting Machines. So it's their proprietary ruler. And like I said, it's not the brand I'm stuck on. It's having some kind of gripping handle. And there are other brands that have those too. Teresa, when I straight line quilt side to side, works from left to right, but thread breaks left to right. Same with wavy like your recent short. Any suggestions to solve this? That's just such a common problem. It has to do with the timing of the needle and the rocker forming that stitch. I think the most common answer I have found and heard others find is that you turn your needle slightly to the left and sometimes slightly to the right, but more often left. So if you're thinking six o'clock, you know, go to 6.30 or 5.30, just a little, and give that a try because that just changes that timing of forming the stitch loop just a hair. And sometimes that's enough to fix the problem. Catherine, I excel at the stand and stare. Okay, we don't want that. We seriously don't want that. So join in the Facebook group because we'll be talking quite a bit about choosing designs and what informs those decisions. Northern Sioux, the stand and stare is a real dilemma. Oh, I think so. It is an actual syndrome. I'm sure we could have that name, you know, put in the annals of history. Catherine, I love that stand and stare. Yeah, it does afflict us all. It does. <laughs> okay, Amanda. My local quilt shop was able to order the long side clamps because they do carry the red snapper system. Good to know. My, none of my local shops carry it, but clearly there are some that do. But red snapper is the name. You can always Google that and perhaps be able to shop locally for those things. I hug my kids. When do you use constant versus regulated mode? Maybe a longer answer for other um, sessions, but I'll tell you in a sentence or two. When I'm doing a design that's freely moving all over the place, I like to use constant. I find it more rhythmic, more soothing, and I love that. When I'm doing something where I have corners or where I'm stopping as I am with the ruler pausing to shift directions, that's when I go to the regulated. Now, I do know people who do ruler work um, with the constant, so it can be done. You stop and start oftener. 
Laurel, I missed your happy type batting. Your thoughts on single versus two layers. Oh, your batting type. Um, I, I almost always do a single layer because I like the feel and the drapeability of a quilt. Really the only time I personally do double is if I'm doing a show type quilt and I really want the quilting to pop and then I put something fluffier like wool on top of this. So the quilting is really emphasized. I did recently quilt one for a client that they were giving to a young college guy and they asked for two layers of batting. Basically they wanted a comforter. So it can be done. Denise, I like your ruler. Me too. <laughs> and Carla, I love that my son knows my mother even though we live 1500 miles apart. I know, that's the beauty. That's the beauty of it, exactly. Exactly. Sarah, I'm loving the clear, sharp lines of cross hatching. I too have the handled ruler. Your thread choice is spot on. I loved hearing your son's voice. Feel free to share more. We will, we will. And after a few weeks, if, if the novelty has worn off, you can tell us that too, because some of the others are, are pretty funny. <laughs> Lauren, another great session on ruler work. Thanks for your time and sharing. Have a great rest of your day. You bet I will. I'm loading another quilt right after this one. <laughs> Trisha, these live sessions are so helpful. As a new long armor, they've taught me so much. Thank you. Good. That, that makes me happy. Jill, thank you, Susan and Dave. Nice one to end on. Thanks, Jill. All right. Thank you guys for joining us. As always, live and unscripted, first and third Friday of every month, 9 a.m. Pacific time. We're always here. New project every time. So stay tuned. Thanks for watching.